and all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God Beautiful way to start worship and to 
continue with our time of worship. And today I want to invite you, if you have your Bibles, if you've got your phones, if you'd open them up to the book of 2 Timothy. We're continuing our message series dealing with foundations. And today we're focusing in on Paul's expression to, to his protege, his disciple, in fact, focusing in on finishing well. Today, if you have your uh, insert, you can fill that out if you'd like to follow along or read some scripture or at least have some notes for, the, for later if you want to refer back to this in just a bit. But as we get started, I want to ask you a quick question. How many of you have a project at home that you have not finished? You started it, but you have not finished it. That's exactly right. We have a few projects at home that we haven't done. Many of us have, have home, owned homes that we were getting ready to sell, and we had lots of projects that we were not going to finish until we were getting ready to sell our house, and then all of a sudden we have to get our, those things finished so that we can sell the house and make the house move and get ready. Veronica and I have decided that in this house, we're not going to wait any longer. If something needs to be fixed, we're we're going to fix it and we're going to get it done. Now, I don't need to talk to you students over here. I know you guys, this is not for you. This would have been for Pepper, but this would have not been for you. But you never wait to finish a project to the very last minute. Pepper did, but not you, Candy. I know you didn't do that. But some of us, when we were in school, we used to wait to the very last minute to get a paper done or a science project done or whatever it was. We would wait and wait and wait to the last minute. And Josh is putting his head down over there and he's saying, yeah, that's me. I shouldn't have done that, Pastor David. Don't talk about me. But uh, our teachers, they can read those papers and they can tell when the student wrote the paper in the last 30 minutes before they turned it in and they can see the typos and all that mess. Finishing well is kind of important. Finishing well in projects at home, finishing well in projects at school, finishing well in our career, in our life, it's just huge. We are grieving Al Crow's death. And one of the reasons we are grieving Al's death is that he lived his life so well. He lived his life so beautifully and he gave his life in so many different capacities that our hearts are sad that we won't see him any longer. But we understand that man finished well and, and all of us would like to think that we're going to be able to do something similar with our life and our story. Now, before I get too serious, I want to talk with you about something that's kind of funny or silly. Some of you might remember a childhood movie, one of my favorite childhood movies. It was Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Anybody like that show? I love the old one. This is one of the characters, and this is a, a character some of you might remember. Her name was Violet Beauregard, and she won, of the, won one of those... Um, golden tickets, and she was kind of famous because she chewed a stick of gum. If you remember, anybody remember how long she chewed that gum for? Three months. She chewed a single stick of gum for three months, and that, that's a long time to chew a piece of gum, and I thought that was kind of funny about Violet Beauregard, but when we think about some candy, most of us don't chew gum for three months, but we might, we might have some other things that we, we go through pretty quick in terms of, I want you to think of this. How many have ever had a big ball of cotton candy? Sweet, tasty, goes away quick. And I want you to think about this. I wonder how many of us, if we were to use this as a metaphor for our faith story, how many people we might know that our faith journey is a lot like that cotton candy. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of light. If some pressure comes, it's going to blow away. It's going to fade away pretty quick and it's delicious. It's not real nutritious, but it just kind of, kind of goes. Some of us in our faith story, some difficulties come, some heartaches come, some challenges come, and we, we're like that cotton candy. We just kind of fade away real fast. And we see that happen as pastors. We see it happen in churches. And it's just not nice. There's another candy that maybe reflects another, another philosophy or another status of, of our faith journey is a jawbreaker. Jawbreakers last forever. Sometimes they hurt our teeth. They hurt our jaws. They do whatever. And our, some po folks, and I hope many of you in this room, are a lot like a jawbreaker in terms of your faith journey. You just keep going on and on and on, and it lasts forever. Things can get tough, things can get challenging, things could get hard, but you're not going to quit because your faith is strong and your faith is solid and your faith is, is compelling you to press forward. Paul's story today, Paul's message to Timothy today, he's challenging followers of Jesus to go the distance He's challenging followers of Christ not to just get in and get started when life is a little bit tough, but to run the gamut of life and to run the gamut of our faith story. That's what he's trying to convey in this message. In fact, as Paul's getting ready to die, he's, he sends this message to Timothy in verses five and, excuse me, in verses six and seven. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. The time has come for my departure. I've fought the good fight. I have finished the race. 
I have kept the faith. Paul knows he's getting ready to die. He's getting ready to be martyred. And as he's aware of his demise, as he's aware of what's getting ready to happen to him, he's ready to go. And in that sense of readiness, he's reflecting about he was a missionary, he was a church planner, he was a, an, an evangelist, he shared the story of Christ, he poured his heart into so many people, and as he's getting ready to go, this message that we're looking at in 2 Timothy, it's his last story to the church. Now, in the next two times we talk about foundations, we're going to hit two more of Paul's letters, but 2 Timothy is his very last one. A couple of details that are important for understanding about Paul in this message is that this was his very last letter, and it's, a, it's an expression of love to Timothy. I've shared with you last Sunday when we talked about this, or two Sundays ago now, that Paul had a very deep relationship, a very close relationship with Timothy, and he is expressing his affection and his desire to continue to mentor Timothy even to the very end. It's also an expression of appreciation for other people. He lists about 15 people besides Timothy that are important to him. 15 or so people who've invested, 15 or so people who've made a difference in his life. And he wants them to see in writing that they made an impact in his life. But he also does another thing in this letter. He also talks about the fact that there are some people who just frustrated the snot out of him. And he calls them by name as well. He writes their names down. And he says, these individuals, they abandoned me, they abandoned the faith, they created some heartache. He, he calls out Alexander and he says to Timothy, he says, Timothy, watch out for this guy because he created a lot of problems for me and he's going to create some problems for you. So he expresses this reality that there's some frustration in life and frustration in ministry and frustration in, in this story. Now, when we think about a couple of quick takeaways in this, I, I want you to focus in on one thing that's very important as we, as we address this. And the first one is here. People are important in life. People are important in life. I don't care if you're a pastor, a teacher, a doctor, a nurse, a, a business leader, a work for the military, whatever you do, whatever it is you do, people are important in life. In fact, they're desperately important to God, and I don't think he wants any follower of Christ to abuse or hurt or take an individual for granted or treat other people as a jerk. He is not interested in his followers treating other people like that. In fact, when Paul pins this letter and he shares this message, he teaches pretty clearly that people who make an impact in our life, we need to recognize them. We need to say thank you. We need to maybe take them out for a coffee. Maybe we need to write a note. Maybe we need to take them to lunch. And maybe in the way that somebody's invested in us, maybe we need to invest in somebody else. And this message that Paul conveys is, is pretty significant for us to understand that as Paul writes this letter to Timothy, his last message, he's expressing how important other people are to him. And then he writes a second thing that I think is a very key takeaway for us. And that's this, people are going to break your heart. People are going to break your heart. And I think Jesus would say to us, serve them anyway. People are going to break your heart. And I think Jesus would say, love them anyway. People are going to break your heart. And I think Jesus would say, help them anyway. Jesus is very clear that people are messed up just like us. And part of our faith story is loving broken people because we are broken people, period. And yet in the same breath, the Bible seems to be very clear that Paul told Timothy to watch out for certain people. He said, watch out for Alexander. So there are some people we need to watch out for. In fact, Jesus said that there are some people that we don't need to throw our, pearl, our pearls before because... They're going to treat us like pigs. So there are some people that we've got to have some pretty firm boundaries in our life. And so we've got to understand that people are going to break our heart. And the reality is we've got to continue to serve. We've got to continue to love. We've got to continue to do the things that Jesus would have us do. But we've got to be smart about it. I have a very good friend. And in fact, I've got a couple of these. Both, I know both of the guys in this story. One of my buddies borrowed a large amount of money from another buddy. And I'm not talking like a couple hundred bucks. I'm talking north of $250,000 for a project. And in this course of this project, um, the fellow's business did not work out. 
and he couldn't pay his buddy back north of a quarter of a million dollars. And I'm friends with both guys, so I'm talking to both guys. And in the course of the conversation, I'm talking to the fellow who uh, lost the money. And he, uh, I said to him, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I've drawn up papers. I've talked to a lawyer, and I'm ready to take this to the next level. And I said, okay. And that, he wasn't excited about that. These were long-term friends, and I didn't talk to him for a while. And a year or so later, I called him up, and I said, hey, how are things going? And we're talking about life, this, that, and the other. And I said to him, I said, uh, so what's up with our friend? And I said, did you go through with the lawsuit? And he blew my mind when he told me this. He said, no, I couldn't do it. I said, why couldn't you do it? He said, David, I don't have many 30-year friends in life, and my 30-year friendship was not worth a quarter of a million dollars. So I backed off of the lawsuit. I was, I was kind of stunned by that because that's an enormous amount of money. He said to me, he said, 30-year friendships are hard to find, and there aren't many of them out there. And he said, and I didn't want to lose it for a stupid reason. Now, I scratched my head because $250,000 is a big stupid reason in my mind. But I thought about that in our story. We live in a time when we're very sensitive to other people, aren't we? We get our feelings hurt pretty quick. And when our feelings get hurt, sometimes we get mad and we just shut people down and we shut people off because we disagree about politics. We disagree about where you like to eat. We disagree about our football teams. We disagree about whatever. And our feelings get hurt and we just, we shut people out. I'll tell you this morning, I noticed a friend of a former friend of mine on Facebook defriended me today. And I'm like, what did I do? And so it, you know, we, it happens. And you just wonder, how do we, how do we process this? Well, People are important, and people are going to break your heart. Love them anyway. Serve them anyway. Be kind. Be Jesus to the best of your capacity, but draw some pretty good boundaries. Now, getting into this, the, the meat of this message, I, I want you to focus in with me for a second, because when Paul talks about this idea to Timothy about finishing well, you've got to understand that as Paul's writing this, he's writing to a young minister and he's talking to him about finishing well as a pastor at the church in Ephesus and finishing well as he served Jesus. So I want you to understand that when Paul is addressing this to Timothy, he's talking to a pastor. But I think there are some principles that go across the line for all of us in whatever career we're in. So as we look at this, the first thing I want you to hear is I want you to think about finishing well and considering the images that Paul used to reflect what discipleship looks like. In Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, he talks about this idea of finishing well, and he, he writes this, endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. In verse 6, similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he doesn't receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. Verse 6, according, and the hardworking farmer, he should be the first to receive his share of the crops. In verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman, a laborer who does not need to be ashamed of the, of the one who correctly handles the word of truth. Paul talks to Timothy and he says, if you want to finish well, I want you to consider these individuals, the soldier, the athlete, the farmer, the workman, the laborer. And I want you to consider what they did. What did they do? They worked hard. They were disciplined. They, they invested their heart, their soul, and their mind into make things happen. They didn't just do it haphazardly. They were fully engaged. And they were a part of the journey of making, making that happen. I got a really cool email yesterday from, from my friend Mike down here. Mike, Mike was running in the Senior Olympics three years ago, and he was running in the 400-yard dash. And he came in third place in Northern Virginia. And his granddaughter wrote, told him this. She said, Grandpa, he said, you were just a little bit too tired to win that race. And so for the last three years, Mike's been thinking about that. And yesterday he ran in the Senior Olympics and he won first place in the mile. I thought that was pretty cool. An athlete, whatever athlete, trains. An athlete trains. A farmer works. A soldier trains and practices shooting and does the drills and all those kinds of things. A laborer makes bricks or lays pipe or hangs electricity or does sheetrock, whatever. They work. As a follower of Christ, if we want to finish well, how does this apply to us? If we want to finish well in our faith story, how does this apply to us? You pray. You get in the Word. You go to worship. You serve. You are constantly and consistently dying to yourself because it takes work 
to make it in this journey of faith. We could talk to any person in this room that's got some gray hair, or in John Dunn's case, no hair. We could talk to anybody who's been following Jesus for a long time, and they'll tell you it doesn't happen just because you think it should happen. It takes some energy and investment, and it takes some, some sweat equity, if you would, just like it does for a soldier, just like it does for a farmer, just like it does for an athlete, just like it does for a laborer. But there's another piece that if you want to finish well, then 2 Timothy chapter, 20, chapter 2, verse 20, Paul pins these words. He said, now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for honorable uses, some for dishonorable. If anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he'll be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So not only do you have to work like those folks that I mentioned, that Paul mentioned, but when you mess up, when you lose your temper, when you get lazy, when you do something stupid, when you do something immoral, when you behave in a way that you shouldn't behave, you need to repent. You need to change. You need to go in another direction. You need to change your focus, your mindset, whatever. And guys, the Bible seems to indicate Deal with it. Don't ignore it. Don't put it aside. Deal with it. In your career, whatever it is, you can get derailed pretty quick if you don't own the mess that sometimes you create. In your marriage, you can find some struggles if you don't take ownership and address some of the challenges that you're a part of. When you're in a relationship with your child, a grandchild, or student, or whatever it might be, if you make a mistake, own it. Say you're sorry and do your best to not do it again. Finishing well, Paul says, consider these images. And the second thing Paul addresses about finishing well is to consider what his last words were. Flip over in chapter 4 and verse 2. He writes this again to his protege, the ones leading a congregation in Ephesus. In verse 2, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. In verse 5, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Paul is talking to a pastor. Paul is talking to an individual who's trying to lead a church with all the tumult and all the turmoil that's going on. And guys, I know in this room there's a handful of ministers in this, in this place, but again, I think this, this applies across the line in career, career trajectory, if you will. But as Paul's writing this to this minister, I, I, I want you to understand something. Being a pastor, being a minister, it's not easy. Bill Higgins, can I get an Amen. It's just not an easy thing to do. And when I don't know if any of you have paid attention to the news this week, but there was a megachurch pastor in Southern California that committed suicide. If you've been paying attention to the news at all this year, he makes about the sixth high-profile pastor who's ended his life with suicide. In fact, there's been about a half dozen, maybe five or six, megachurch pastors in the past year who've not only walked away from the ministry, They've walked away from their faith. One pastor was in a church of over 40,000 people, and he just announced on Twitter that he's no longer a Christian. He doesn't believe in Jesus anymore. I, I scratch my head and I say, how does, how does that happen? And it happens in life. It happens as things change. It happens in a variety of, of different ways. And Paul, Paul says to these pastors and to these leaders, he says, preach the word. You've got to stand on something solid. He says, be ready. He says, correct, rebuke, and address things with patience. Don't be a jerk about it. He says, be level-headed. Share your faith story and deal with the tough stuff. And guys, here's what I want to focus in for a second. All of us face tough stuff. Whether we're working in a bank whether we're working at Facebook, whether we're working at the government, wherever we are, we face tough stuff. And if we don't address it with some help, talking to some people, it leads us to do some pretty scary things. Talk to people when you get into that very desperate, desperate place. Don't try to navigate it on your own. How does Paul's message to Timothy about preaching the word and being ready and correcting and rebuking, how does that speak to a teacher at, at Manassas City Schools? Or how does that speak to a person in the hospital? Well, I think Paul might say to you, do your job. 
Do your job well. Be ready to do your job. Show up. Be patient with others when they let you down. Be level-headed. Be passionate about your job. Don't just work for a paycheck. Be passionate and then deal with the tough stuff. Don't let the tough stuff sweep you away. Deal, deal with that. And the final thing that I think Paul sends this message about how we last in faith and life is kind of a message that he conveys throughout this book. One of my life verses is in 2 Timothy 1.7 where I think Paul talks about this idea of being timid and where the scripture says, and you can read the scripture, for God didn't give you a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and of love and of self-control. And I think we have to deal with the things that make us nervous. A lot of the stuff that makes us anxious or nervous, whether it's health scares or work stuff or family stuff, the reality is we've got to address it and not let that fear keep us away from it. I think a second thing that Paul talks about in helping us last in our faith is being strong in grace. That reflects on mercy and forgiveness and walking in the fruit of the Spirit. A third thing that Paul talks about in lasting in our life and our faith is in trusting in good people. Surround yourself with good people. A fourth thing again he says is endure hardship. Life is just tough. It's just hard. And a final thing that I'm going to focus on now is cleanse yourself. When you mess up, own it. Own it. Turn from it and go in another direction. That's another way that we look at this. Paul sends this message to Timothy that I think we get a couple really good takeaways. People are important and people are going to break your heart. That's just the reality of life. And when we think about how we want to finish well, we have to emphasize and focus in on these images that Paul, Paul presented to us. The book of 2 Timothy might be my favorite, favorite book in the New Testament. And there's a very strong reason why. In February 1986, when I committed my life to Christ, I started going to a small group. And Jama and Steve Cook were teaching 2 Timothy in that gathering. And I, I had not been in a Bible study for quite a while. I had been living that, the party lifestyle that college students are wont to do. And I did a lot of dumb stuff. But when I met Jesus on that Sunday night of February 6, I knew that I needed to start going in a direction. And the way I needed to deal with that was to get into the Word. And I went into a church and I went into a small group and that's that. And in the course of, of the next several weeks as we studied this Word, I listened to them talk about Paul's story. And we got to this point in 2 Timothy chapter 4 where Paul said, at my first defense, no one came to my aid. No one came to my side. Everyone abandoned me, except Jesus. Jesus was there. And in my course of my journey, in the course of my life, my friends didn't understand the new direction that I was going. And I kind of went off by myself, not by choice, but that's just the way it happened. And in the course of trying to figure out my faith story, I got plugged into this church and I started finding some hope and finding some help and finding some direction and finding some strength in his word. And I understood pretty clearly that everybody else might fall aside, but Jesus was going to stand right there. And I learned to lean pretty heavily on Jesus during some interesting young adult seasons, an interesting young adult season. And then I watched as God started bringing people into my life like Paul like Luke, like Mark, like Aquila, like Onesiphorus, like all those 16 people he mentions throughout this little letter. And I saw that God was surrounding me with some people to walk in this faith story. And I think that's part of our story, understanding that Jesus is never going to leave you or forsake you, and that he is going to pull some people around you. Be willing, be ready. Maybe your call is to be that person. I don't know. Maybe your call is to be a Paul to someone else. I don't know. Maybe you're walking through a very hard valley and you just need to be reminded that Jesus is not going to forsake you. And I want to say he will never forsake you nor abandon you. Would you pray with me, please? Fathers, we focus in on your word this morning. We're reminded that your desire is that we finish well that we finish well as families, we finish well in, in our life, that we finish well in our career, that we finish well our faith journey, that we finish well, Father God, when we ultimately are called home to receive our heavenly reward. 
Father God, I, my prayer today is that as we reflect on this word and we think about this message, we, we are encouraged to take the steps necessary now that would allow us to finish well. Help us, Father God, that we might live life in such a way that, that when our time is called and our time has come, that we would have impacted people, we would have loved people, we would have served people, that we would have lifted high the name of Jesus wherever we go, whether that's in a school or a hospital or a business or a government agency, wherever. And that people will look at us and say, that person finished well. Father, that doesn't happen by chance, and it doesn't happen on accident. It takes work. Speak to our hearts, Father. Help us to do the work. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.